Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As many of you know, my son Soren and I are going to be part of a trip organized by the Northern Texas, Northern Louisiana Synod to Sierra Leone next month. We're going to be among seven people who are visiting that West African country to meet the people of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Sierra Leone, to see their ministries and their facilities and to learn about their lives, at least in a small way. And there are a lot of reasons that I'm excited about this, and there's a lot that I'm looking forward to sharing after we get back. But the most important, the most exciting aspect of this for me is that the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Sierra Leone was not planted by European or North American missionaries, unlike most Lutheran churches in Africa. Lay people from Sierra Leone encountered Lutheran churches in other countries and thought, this is something that we want to be a part of. Now, in North America, and maybe in Europe too, Lutheranism can sometimes take on a kind of cultural definition. And this becomes a real problem when we try to reach beyond our familiar cultural footprint. But no one told the new Lutherans of Sierra Leone that being Lutheran was a matter of having roots in Germany or Norway or Sweden. No one told them that Lutheranism is about what kind of coffee you drink after worship and singing a mighty fortress and having potlucks with either casserole or hot dish, depending on which part of the country you are from. They embraced Lutheranism and our unique understanding of God's grace for reasons that don't have anything to do with any of that. And that's, that's good and right, because... As of today, the two largest Lutheran churches in the world are in Ethiopia and Tanzania. And the Lutheran churches in Indonesia and Madagascar are larger than the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, our church body. Perhaps they should be sending missionaries to us. Maybe there are some things that we could learn from them. The second important fact about the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Sierra Leone. The first is that it's lay-led and lay-planted. The second is that Sierra Leone is a very poor country. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. They have no Lutheran seminary, and it is very economically difficult for someone to leave their home and their family in order to study in another country to become a pastor. So they need and have needed partners and friends. And that is what our Northern Texas, Northern Louisiana Synod has been to them, a partner who provides resources for a church that has tremendous potential to share the gospel, but very few resources with which to do it. And the distinction between churches with resources and churches without, or to put it more crudely, between rich churches and poor churches, is a very powerful distinction in the Christian world. And it's a very destructive distinction. And this exists not just between countries, but within our own denomination, even within our own city, where a church with few people but enough money can call a a pastor, and another church with the same number of people and maybe even more mission going on, but without money, cannot. Distinction is the main theme of the two stories that we hear today from the scriptures. The first, we hear it in the letter of James, where James describes what would have been a very common scene in a Roman city in the ancient Mediterranean world. James says, when a person comes into your assembly, into your religious gathering, with gold rings and with fancy clothes, you make a big deal of that one and make sure that that person has a place of honor and deference to sit. But when a person comes in dressed all raggedy, 
you make that one stand up at the edge of the room or take the place of a servant at the footstool of the one who is presiding at the assembly. Now, to be clear, no one in James's world would have thought this was at all odd or scandalous. Hierarchy makes this world go round in the, in the time of James. A wealthy person coming to a Jewish or Christian religious gathering to share gifts, offer patronage, might be doing that in, as a part of seeking office, public office. Because if somebody dispensed gifts to you, if you were less wealthy, you were then, in a way, obligated to act as their client. You were their uh, supporter for something else. It was a world of patrons and clients all the way down. And people were accustomed to showing honor and deference to the people who were their patrons or could be their patrons. That was just common sense. But James does not follow common sense. James follows Jesus. And Jesus is clear, both in his words and especially in his actions, that you have to treat people with dignity, regardless of whether they are doing you a favor or whether they will ever be in a position to do a favor to you in return. The distinction between rich and poor might matter out there, James says, but if you create that distinction, if you insist on that distinction, if you acknowledge that distinction in here, you become a judge with evil thoughts. <coughs> But the more striking story of distinctions within and around the community of faith comes from our gospel today. This is a very striking, this is a very powerful story. It can really shake you up if you let it. It's from Mark's gospel, which we've been hearing for most of this year. And Jesus in this story is, you might say, taking a break from his work as an itinerant healer and holy man. So he goes from the predominantly Jewish region of Galilee, where he has, as far as we can tell, lived his life until this point, to the region of Tyre, which is up on the Mediterranean coast, which is a predominantly Gentile area. He goes up there almost as if he is hiding out. But the thing about Jesus is that he can never really hide out, can he? Over and over in Mark's gospel, he tries to withdraw from the people, and people come and find him anyway. And even here in a predominantly Gentile city, a woman comes into the house where he's staying and bows down at his feet and begs for help for her daughter, who is afflicted with an unclean spirit. Now listen to what Jesus tells her. Let the children be fed first. For it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Now, Jesus does not exactly say no in so many words, does he? He doesn't say, lady, I'm off the clock. He doesn't say, leave me alone. He doesn't say, come back another time. Which, in perfect honesty, is how I react when I get calls on my day off. Jesus doesn't do that in so many words, but he does state a distinction. There are children and there are dogs. Everyone in this scene would have understood children to be the children of God's covenant with Abraham and his descendants, God's covenant with the children of Israel. And these children, Jesus says, must be cared for first. And everyone in this scene would have understood the dogs to be the Gentiles, the people who are outside of the covenant, people like this woman who cannot be served while the children are still in need. Now, this sounds very harsh, maybe even cruel. And contemporary readers are often not kind to Jesus on this point. 
But what happens? Does the woman say, well, I gave it a shot and go home, figure something else out? Does the woman get defensive and angry and, and lash out at Jesus? Say, Who are you calling a dog, buster? Who are you anyway? Does she kneel there in silence and humility, hoping that the holy man will change his mind? She doesn't do any of those things. What does happen? She makes a counter-argument. Even the dogs, she says, eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table. Now, I can't say whether Jesus expected to hear this, but I do cherish the thought that he hoped, that he wanted to hear it because of how he responds. He says, for saying this, your daughter has been made well. The demon has left your daughter. Now think about that for a moment. Jesus doesn't say helping you is impossible because you're a Gentile and my job, my mission is only to the children of Israel. And he doesn't say there will never be any help for you people but only that the people who are inside need to be tended first. What he does is he asserts a distinction. And she makes an argument for ignoring that distinction. And she is correct. Because, and this is really important, please remember this if you forget everything else, because all such distinctions between who deserves and who doesn't, are made up. When Christians these days talk about this story, we like to focus on the character of Jesus. Does his mind change, or was this a setup that he orchestrated? Does he redefine his mission in response to this woman? But the real mystery to my mind is the woman herself. How does she get herself to keep going after being told something that sounds an awful lot like no, and not a very nice no at that? How does she keep knocking after a door has been slammed in her face? How does she find a way to insist that the distinction between children and dogs is fake when everyone around her takes it for granted? The challenge for us as Christians in this story is not how to be like Jesus. The challenge for us as Christians in this story is how to be like this woman. Very often in the Gospels, Jesus is the exemplary figure, the the figure to imitate. But here we are invited to imitate this woman. How to be like the church in a place like Sierra Leone, where there are all kinds of ways to hear no and all kinds of distinctions that will be thrown in your face by the world. So when we say that we embrace our community in all its diversity, there in our second core value, when we say that, that means more than saying everyone is welcome. It means more than saying y'all come. Embrace isn't a passive word. It's not just about removing barriers and saying, we'd be happy if you showed up. Embrace requires us to actively deny, to actively deny the fake, made-up distinctions that define our world just as they define the world of Jesus and James. So yes, we want to, as we've said here today, open our doors to anyone and everyone who seeks to hear God's word and receive God's grace. And we have the obligation to invite people through those doors. But we also need to commit to going out to new places and meeting new people. Just like the woman in today's story does. She crosses crosses a threshold that she isn't supposed to cross. And she kneels before someone she isn't really supposed to have dealings with. 
And it means saying in those places and to those people with our actions and our words that God is for them too, even if they have never set foot in this building, even if they've never heard anything about what a Lutheran is. Embrace is a big word. It can be a tough word. It's much easier, at least it can be much easier, to say, well, at least I tried. It's easier to be defensive or resentful in the face of frustration or rejection. It's even easier to be patient in silence while you wait for the world to come back around to you and recognize the error of its ways. But none of us were baptized into a faith that cherishes ease. And that's why it's important that we acknowledge that we aspire. We picked that word very carefully, very deliberately. We aspire to be an inclusive center of community gathering, engagement, and connection because we know who we are. We are not an especially diverse congregation. We do not come very close to reflecting the actual variety of human experiences of our community setting, not in any way, not in race or ethnicity, but also not in education or economics or family structure or homeownership or almost anything else. Embracing our full humanity, our own full humanity, means embracing the humanity of the world around us. And that is never a task that you finish. It is always, it is always an aspiration. It is always a hope that is greater than reality. But aspiration is God's gift to us. It's what makes people in a low-income country far from the doors of the church in Wittenberg take up a new Christian faith. It's what makes a woman from outside of the covenant knock on the door and come to Jesus for help in her hour of need. And it's what makes a church see a path into God's future. Amen.